I want to take a minute to show you, well, I want to take a minute to show you where this comes from. And this is really probably um, a little bit more advanced than, well, the derivation of this is more advanced than this class, really. But, uh, but I, I think it's just useful to show that I didn't just make it up, that, you know, that, it, that you can derive it. It does come from somewhere, from assumptions. So um, I'll go through the derivation. Uh, you can certainly take notes if you want, but just understand that, you know, hang with me and pay attention, but you, you won't be tested on the derivation, right? you know, where it comes from. Okay. So if we have a, a rock subject to a hydrostatic external pressure. So it's equal and opposite on all sides. And we'll call that guy P. And our rock is porous. And it has a pore pressure. The pores have a pore pressure That pore pressure is also P. Okay, so if I t take a little piece of the solid here and I cut that guy out, what would my stress look like on that little piece of solid? Yeah, a little piece of solid in between, you know, external to the pores. It'd be uniform. Also P, right? And you know, th this is where things are going to get a little more. We haven't really introduced uh, this type of notation, but it, it makes it useful for this derivation. So. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about a stress, and I, I'm going to write the individual components, IJ. Right? So it's a tensor, okay. And we can do a decomposition of this tensor where we're going to say that the stress has a shear component or a deviatoric component, okay? So this is the part of the stress tensor that undergoes or handles, resists shear deformation, okay? And then the hydrostatic component. So the hydrostatic component we've already talked about This is the, in the last lecture, we, we talked about the volumetric stress, okay? This is just another way to write this, okay? Now, this is where the notation gets a little confusing, maybe, in that in the last lecture, I just wrote that this was the trace of S, so the sum of the diagonals, right? This guy. So here we're just use this sigma kk is just shorthand for that. And it's shorthand meaning uh, this was a notation that was actually introduced by Einstein. And really what that means is the sum, uh, the sum over k uh, so, I'm sorry, sum over i, sum over k. So it, it would be something like that. So basically, you're just summing over both variables. Um, 
but we use the shorthand notation that whenever you see a repeated index like that, so if, if k repeats itself, it means you sum over k. Right? So it, it's probably not uh, necessary to, let's just say that, sum over k. All right. So for this little piece of rock, okay, it's hydrostatically confined, equal pressure on all sides. Okay. There is no shear stress for this scenario. So this thing is zero, and I just have that the pressure is equal to, well, I'm sorry, yeah. We, we actually introduce a definition here that, that says the pressure is equal to one-third Sigma KK. So the pressure is is this guy. I'll get rid of that. Okay. The pressure is the negative of that term. Okay. So, so for this little piece of this little piece of rock right here, we have that the stress tensor sigma i j is equal to minus the pressure times this thing. And by the way, this thing is just the identity matrix. It, it, it's another fancy word for it is the Kronecker delta function, which just means that if i equals to j, you have a one. And if i not equal to j, it's zero. Well, you can see that that's just the identity matrix. Okay. Okay. So if you remember from last time, I introduced uh, for linear elasticity a constitutive law that looked like the stress is equal to lambda times the tra trace of the strain times i <coughs> plus 2 mu times the strain, right? Where these are tensors. And so now I'm just going to rewrite that in my new fancy notation. Okay, and you remember l lambda is something called Lemay's constant, and I had a chart that showed you how all the elastic constants are related to one another, and so lambda, we could rewrite lambda as k minus two third mu. That's just right off that chart. Okay, I just want to write lambda in terms of k and mu. Okay. And so if I do that and I plug it back in, if I plug that back in over here, then I have sigma ij is equal to k sigma kk sigma ij minus 2 mu 1 third sigma kk sigma ij plus 2 mu sigma ij. And if I just rewrite that, then I have k sigma kk Okay, so I have this, all right. Well, if you remember also from last time, I introduced something called the volumetric strain, which is this guy, right? The volumetric strain. So this is the part of the strain 
that is due to hydrostatic confinement, right? Equal confinement on all sides. Take my cube and I squeeze it equally. Okay? So if I take the total strain and I subtract off the part of the strain due to hydrostatic confinement, what's left is the shear. Okay? But what we're interested in writing down this equation for is this scenario which has no shear. Right? So in that case, this whole thing is equal to zero. And I'm left with, I have a definition for strain on the right in terms of pressure, on the left in terms of pressure. So I have minus P sigma IJ is equal to K sigma uh, KK sigma IJ. Those guys cancel. And I can write my volumetric strain in terms of my pressure now in the bulk modulus. Okay? And this bulk modulus is the bulk because it's it's for this little element that only includes the solid. Okay? So this is the bulk modulus of the solid. So in other words, that's the bulk modulus if I were to go to the lab and test only the grains. That's the bulk modulus I would I would measure. So in this in this scenario the, the only strain I have, right, if I write down the strain, like I wrote down the stress, as a strain due to deviatoric strain plus one-third sigma kk sigma ij. So basically the, the part of the strain tensor that's due to shear and the part that's due to volumetric compression, well, there's no shear. So my total strain tensor is minus P over 3 KS sigma IJ. Okay? So this is the, the total strain in the solid. All right? Do the effect of pressure. If we go back to our little block, so everything, everything we did so far was for that little, that little component of the solid material, right? Now we want to write down the stress-strain relationship for the whole thing, right? The solid plus the pore space and the fluid, right? So if we go to the lab and we test this guy, and now including the effects of the pore space, we can develop a constitutive relation that looks like this. So again, there's some funny notation, but Basically, C is a, now a fourth order tensor. This is the elasticity constant. So this is, this is the constant you'd measure in the laboratory. And I've used this repeated index summation again. So wherever you see a repeated index, I'm summing over K and I'm summing over L. Okay? And I can, I can invert this relationship. So in other words, I can solve for the strain in terms of the stress, like this. Okay, where D is the inverse of C. Okay. 
So if I write down, if I write down now this equation, okay, And now, since I'm testing the whole thing, right, I'm testing now the whole thing, I have an effective stress, so it's like sigma ij plus the pore pressure, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off the strain, so, so this is the strain in the whole thing, and then I'm going to track. I'm going to track, uh, subtract off the strain in the solid rock. Okay. And this guy, this guy here is going to be equal to my exact effective stress. So this, and I have an expression for epsilon KL here. So then I'm going to say ij kl is equal to d kl ij that whole thing and now I can just start simplifying. Well, you have to take my word for it, but that, you know, it, this work operates like a matrix. If I have, remember, D was C inverse. So if I have C times C inverse, I get like an identity matrix back. In this case, it's, a, it's an identity tensor. But an identity tensor times another tensor doesn't change the other tensor, okay? So when I multiply that by that, then I just get this identity tensor and it doesn't change sigma ij, so I get sigma ij there, okay? So I have over here, just rewriting this part, sigma ij plus alpha p is equal to uh, sigma ij plus, now I gotta multiply this through, c ij KL uh, times P IJ minus one third one third I should have carried a KS there, sorry, one third KS P Delta KL, Delta IJ, well, sorry, not yet. Right. And these guys can then cancel. And then I can multiply both sides of the equation by Delta IJ. And when I do that, I'm summing over, I'm summing over the i's and the j's here, and I'm and that's the identity matrix. So I'm summing the identity matrix across the diagonal, and that turns out to be three. And this guy turns out to be three, right? 
And so the threes cancel, the P's cancel, and what I end up with is alpha equals one plus <coughs> that. And that's the general relationship for BO's coefficient. Oh, sorry, it should be a 9 here. That's the general relationship for BO's coefficient. And it turns out if the material is isotropic, then this reduces to 9 lambda plus 6 mu over 9, which is the bulk modulus. And this is the bulk modulus because it comes from CIJKL, which was the elastic, this was the elasticity coefficients that we measured when we went to the lab and we ran the tests on the solid plus the pore fluid, okay? So, this is the total bulk modulus, okay? And so then ultimately what we get is, and this is the way you'll typically see it. Uh, apologize, this should be a minus. Comes from this minus sign here. So this is what this is, BO's coefficient for an isotropic rock. What does isotropic mean? I told you last time. It has infinite planes of symmetry, right? No matter, no matter how, which direct, you know, I could take a specimen and cut it out of a rock, and then no matter what orientation I cut it from, I'll get the same properties, right? So for an isotropic rock, this is your BO coefficient, and it's the ratio, it's 1 minus the ratio of the total bulk modulus to the bulk modulus of the grains only. So there it is. And uh, I'll give, just give you some examples. Uh, for very loosely consolidated materials like sands, like in conventional reservoirs, right? Then, in that case, if I if I go to the lab, what is sand made of? Huh? Like, yeah, quartz is a good approximation, right? So, if I go to the lab, I take a, an individual sand grain, and I go to the lab. And let's assume we can, you know, it's a perfect crystal or whatever, so that it's a perfect cube. And we go to the lab and we squeeze that little guy. It's actually going to be quite strong. Much stronger than if I take a collection of sand that's got partial saturation and I test it, right? I mean, this is very, very obvious, you know. We've all played at the beach, right? And you take a, well, I say we all have. Maybe some of you haven't, but if you've ever played with sand at the beach, right? You know, if you have some water in it, it it's very malleable. You can, you, can, you can squeeze it, right? Well, that's, I mean, when you take a, uh, a handful of sand and squeeze it together and compress it, I mean, you're essentially, what's resisting that compression is the bulk modulus of the, of the material. And that, while there's some there, the fact that you can squeeze it means it's not that strong, especially if you were to have a whole handful of quartz uh, solid quartz, and you tried to squeeze it, you wouldn't be able to b move it at all, right? So in this case, the bulk, the total bulk modulus is much, much less than the bulk modulus of the quartz in my sand example, right? And so in that case, the BO's coefficient is, you know, bec because the KT over KS is <coughs> roughly zero, then the BO's coefficient is approximately one. And then if you have a VO coefficient approximately 1, there are 
Terzaghi definition of effective stress that we've been using is quite a good approximation, right? And so for most conventional, and that's why we've sort of all we've talked about this far, because for most conventional reservoirs, it's a good approximation. Where it's not is when you have highly consolidated material, like in a shale. In this case, your BO's coefficient is going to be closer, you know, on the order of a half to three quarters. So, you know, as a rule of thumb, you might just, if you don't know anything else, you could use two thirds. So here's some actual data, and in this in this plot, it's also plotted as a function of hydrostatic compression or pressure. So the amount of pressure on the rock as it's tested. And so you see, for you know a dry sand, it's it's you know in the 0.9 to 1 range, and for a sandstone, it's a more consolidated material. It's, it's lower, right, in the 0.4 to 0.6 range. 